Caffeine, Wikipedia article audio. Caffeine is a central nervous system stimulant of the methylxanthine class. It is the world's most widely consumed psychoactive drug. Unlike many other psychoactive substances, it is legal and unregulated in nearly all parts of the world. There are several known mechanisms of action to explain the effects of caffeine. The most prominent is that it reversibly blocks the action of adenosine on its receptor and consequently prevents the onset of drowsiness induced by adenosine. Caffeine also stimulates certain portions of the autonomic nervous system. Caffeine is a bitter, white crystalline purine, a methylxanthine alkaloid, and is chemically related to the adenine and guanine bases of deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. It is found in the seeds, nuts, or leaves of a number of plants native to South America and East Asia and helps to protect them against predator insects and to prevent germination of nearby seeds. The most well-known source of caffeine is the coffee bean, a misnomer for the seed of coffea plants. Beverages containing caffeine are ingested to relieve or prevent drowsiness and to improve performance. To make these drinks, caffeine is extracted by steeping the plant product in water, a process called infusion. Caffeine-containing drinks, such as coffee, tea, and cola, are very popular. As of 2014, 85% of American adults consumed some form of caffeine daily, consuming 164 mg on average. Use Medical Caffeine can have both positive and negative health effects. It can treat and prevent the premature infant breathing disorders bronchopulmonary dysplasia of prematurity and apnea of prematurity. Caffeine citrate is on the WHO model list of essential medicines. It may confer a modest protective effect against some diseases including Parkinson's disease. Some people experience sleep disruption or anxiety if they consume caffeine, but others show little disturbance. Evidence of a risk during pregnancy is equivocal. Some authorities recommend that pregnant women limit consumption to the equivalent of two cups of coffee per day or less. Caffeine can produce a mild form of drug dependence associated with withdrawal symptoms such as sleepiness, headache, and irritability when an individual stops using caffeine after repeated daily intake. Tolerance to the autonomic effects of increased blood pressure and heart rate, and increased urine output, develops with chronic use. Caffeine is classified by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration as generally recognized as safe. Toxic doses, over 10 grams per day for an adult, are much higher than typical doses of under 500 mg per day. A cup of coffee contains 8175 mg of caffeine, depending on what bean is used and how it is prepared. Thus it requires roughly 5100 ordinary cups of coffee to reach a lethal dose. However, pure powdered caffeine, which is available as a dietary supplement, can be lethal in tablespoon-sized amounts. Caffeine is used in Caffeine is a central nervous system stimulant that reduces fatigue and drowsiness. At normal doses, Caffeine has variable effects on learning and memory, but it generally improves reaction time, wakefulness, concentration, and motor coordination. The amount of caffeine needed to produce these effects varies from person to person, depending on body size and degree of tolerance. The desired effects arise approximately one hour after consumption and the desired effects of a moderate dose usually subside after about 3 or 4 hours. Caffeine can delay or prevent sleep and improves task performance during sleep deprivation. 
shift workers who use caffeine make fewer mistakes due to drowsiness. Enhancing Performance a systematic review and meta-analysis from 2014 found that concurrent caffeine and L-theanine use has synergistic psychoactive effects that promote alertness, attention, and task switching. These effects are most pronounced during the first hour post-dose. Caffeine is a proven ergogenic aid in humans. Caffeine improves athletic performance in aerobic and anaerobic conditions. Moderate doses of caffeine can improve sprint performance, cycling and running time trial performance, endurance, and cycling power output. Caffeine increases basal metabolic rate in adults. Cognitive For the general population of healthy adults, Health Canada advises a daily intake of no more than 400 mg. In healthy children, caffeine intake produces effects that are modest and typically innocuous. There is no evidence that coffee stunts a child's growth. For children age 12 and under, Health Canada recommends a maximum daily caffeine intake of no more than 2.5 mg per kilogram of body weight. Based on average body weights of children, this translates to the following age-based intake limits. Health Canada has not developed advice for adolescents because of insufficient data. However, they suggest that daily caffeine intake for this age group be no more than 2.5 mg kg body weight. This is because the maximum adult caffeine dose may not be appropriate for lightweight adolescents or for younger adolescents who are still growing. The daily dose of 2.5 mg kg body weight would not cause adverse health effects in the majority of adolescent caffeine consumers. This is a conservative suggestion since older and heavier weight adolescents may be able to consume adult doses of caffeine without suffering adverse effects. Physical The UK Food Standards Agency has recommended that pregnant women should limit their caffeine intake, out of prudence, to less than 200 mg of caffeine a day the equivalent of two cups of instant coffee or one and a half to two cups of fresh coffee. The American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists concluded in 2010 that caffeine consumption is safe up to 200 mg per day in pregnant women. For women who breastfeed, are pregnant, or may become pregnant, Health Canada recommends a maximum daily caffeine intake of no more than 300 mg or a little over 2-8 ounces cups of coffee. Specific Populations There are conflicting reports in the scientific literature about caffeine use during pregnancy. A 2011 review found that caffeine during pregnancy does not appear to increase the risk of congenital malformations, miscarriage, or growth retardation even when consumed in moderate to high amounts. Other reviews, however, concluded that there is some evidence that higher caffeine intake by pregnant women may be associated with a higher risk of giving birth to a low birth weight baby, and may be associated with a higher risk of pregnancy loss. A systematic review, analyzing the results of observational studies, suggests that women who consume large amounts of caffeine prior to becoming pregnant may have a higher risk of experiencing pregnancy loss. Adults Caffeine can increase blood pressure and cause vasoconstriction. Coffee and caffeine can affect gastrointestinal motility and gastric acid secretion. Caffeine in low doses may cause weak bronchodilation for up to four hours in asthmatics. In postmenopausal women, high caffeine consumption can accelerate bone loss. 
doses of caffeine equivalent to the amount normally found in standard servings of tea, coffee, and carbonated soft drinks appear to have no diuretic action. However, acute ingestion of caffeine in large doses results in a short-term stimulation of urine output in individuals who have been deprived of caffeine for a period of days or weeks. This increase is due to both a diuresis and a natriuresis, it is mediated via proximal tubular adenosine receptor blockade. The acute increase in urinary output may increase the risk of dehydration. However, chronic users of caffeine develop a tolerance to this effect and experience no increase in urinary output. Children Minor undesired symptoms from caffeine ingestion not sufficiently severe to warrant a psychiatric diagnosis are common and include mild anxiety, jitteriness, insomnia, increased sleep latency, and reduced coordination. Caffeine can have negative effects on anxiety disorders. According to a 2011 literature review, Caffeine use is positively associated with anxiety and panic disorders. At high doses, typically greater than 300 mg, caffeine can both cause and worsen anxiety. For some people, discontinuing caffeine use can significantly reduce anxiety. Some textbooks state that caffeine is a mild euphoriant, others state that it is not a euphoriant and one states that it is and is not a euphoriant. Whether or not caffeine can result in an addictive disorder depends on how addiction is defined. Some diagnostic models, such as the ICDM-9 and ICD-10, include a classification of caffeine addiction under a broader diagnostic model. Some state that certain users can become addicted and therefore unable to decrease use even though they know there are negative health effects. Caffeine does not appear to be a reinforcing stimulus, and some degree of aversion may actually occur, with people preferring placebo over caffeine in a study on drug abuse liability published in a NIDA research monograph. Some state that research does not provide support for an underlying biochemical mechanism for caffeine addiction. Other research states it can affect the reward system. Caffeine addiction was added to the ICDM-9 and ICD-10. However, its addition was contested with claims that this diagnostic model of caffeine addiction is not supported by evidence. The American Psychiatric Association SDSM-5 does not include the diagnosis of a caffeine addiction but proposes criteria for the disorder for more study. Adolescence Withdrawal can cause mild to clinically significant distress or impairment in daily functioning. The frequency at which this occurs is self-reported at 11% but in lab tests only half of the people who report withdrawal actually experience it, casting doubt on many claims of dependence. Mild to increasingly severe physical dependence and withdrawal symptoms may occur upon abstinence, with greater than 100 mg caffeine per day, some symptoms associated with psychological dependence may also occur during withdrawal. Caffeine dependence can involve withdrawal symptoms such as fatigue, headache, irritability, depressed mood, reduced contentedness, inability to concentrate, sleepiness or drowsiness, stomach pain, and joint pain. Withdrawal headaches are experienced by roughly half of those who stop consuming caffeine for two days following an average daily intake of 235 mg. Pregnancy and breastfeeding The ICD-10 includes a diagnostic model for caffeine dependence, but the DSM-5 does not. The APA, which published the DSM-5, acknowledged that there was sufficient evidence in order to create a diagnostic model of caffeine dependence for the DSM-5, 
but they noted that the clinical significance of this disorder is unclear. The DSM-5 instead lists caffeine use disorder in the emerging models section of the manual. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia in premature infants for both prevention and treatment. It may improve weight gain during therapy and reduce the incidence of cerebral palsy as well as reduce language and cognitive delay. On the other hand, subtle long-term side effects are possible, apnea of prematurity as a primary treatment, but not prevention, orthostatic hypotension treatment. In moderate doses, caffeine may reduce symptoms of depression and lower suicide risk. Tolerance varies for daily, regular caffeine users and high caffeine users. High doses of caffeine have been shown to produce complete tolerance to some, but not all of the effects of caffeine. Doses as low as 100 mg slash day such as a 6 ounces cup of coffee or 2 to 3 12 ounces servings of caffeinated soft drink, may continue to cause sleep disruption, among other intolerances. Non-regular caffeine users have the least caffeine tolerance for sleep disruption. Some coffee drinkers develop tolerance to its undesired sleep disrupting effects, but others apparently do not. A protective effect of caffeine against Alzheimer's disease is possible, but the evidence is inconclusive. Caffeine increases intraocular pressure in those with glaucoma but does not appear to affect normal individuals. It may protect people from liver cirrhosis. Caffeine may lessen the severity of acute mountain sickness if taken a few hours prior to attaining a high altitude. Parazanthine, increases lipolysis, leading to elevated glycerol and free fatty acid levels in blood plasma, theobromine, dilates blood vessels and increases urine volume. Theobromine is also the principal alkaloid in the cocoa bean, theophylline, relaxes smooth muscles of the bronchi, and is used to treat asthma. The therapeutic dose of theophylline however, is many times greater than the levels attained from caffeine metabolism. Consumption of 1 1.5 grams per day is associated with a condition known as caffeinism. Caffeinism usually combines caffeine dependency with a wide range of unpleasant symptoms including nervousness, irritability, restlessness, insomnia, headaches, and palpitations after caffeine use. Adverse Effects Physical 2 Psychological Reinforcement Disorders Caffeine overdose can result in a state of central nervous system overstimulation called caffeine intoxication. This syndrome typically occurs only after ingestion of large amounts of caffeine well over the amounts found in typical caffeinated beverages and caffeine tablets. The symptoms of caffeine intoxication are comparable to the symptoms of overdoses of other stimulants, they may include restlessness, fidgeting, anxiety, excitement, insomnia, flushing of the face, increased urination, gastrointestinal disturbance, muscle twitching, a rambling flow of thought and speech, irritability, irregular or rapid heartbeat, and psychomotor agitation. In cases of much larger overdoses, mania, depression, lapses in judgment, disorientation, disinhibition, delusions, hallucinations, or psychosis may occur, and rhabdomyolysis can be provoked. Water extraction Coffee beans are soaked in water. The water, which contains many other compounds in addition to caffeine and contributes to the flavor of coffee, is then passed through activated charcoal, which removes the caffeine. The water can then be put back with the beans and evaporated dry, leaving decaffeinated coffee with its original flavor. 
Coffee manufacturers recover the caffeine and resell it for use in soft drinks and over-the-counter caffeine tablets, supercritical carbon dioxide extraction, supercritical carbon dioxide is an excellent non-polar solvent for caffeine, and is safer than the organic solvents that are otherwise used. The extraction process is simple. CO2 is forced through the green coffee beans at temperatures above 31.1 degrees Celsius and pressures above 73 atm. Under these conditions, CO2 is in a supercritical state, it has gas-like properties that allow it to penetrate deep into the beans but also liquid-like properties that dissolve 97-99% of the caffeine. The caffeine-laden CO2 is then sprayed with high-pressure water to remove the caffeine. The caffeine can then be isolated by charcoal adsorption or by distillation, recrystallization, or reverse osmosis, extraction by organic solvents, certain organic solvents such as ethyl acetate present much less health and environmental hazard than chlorinated and aromatic organic solvents used formerly. Another method is to use triglyceride oils obtained from spent coffee grounds. Massive overdose can result in death. The LD50 of caffeine in humans is dependent on individual sensitivity, but is estimated to be 15200 mg per kilogram of body mass. A number of fatalities have been caused by overdoses of readily available powdered caffeine supplements for which the estimated lethal amount is less than a tablespoon. The lethal dose is lower in individuals whose ability to metabolize caffeine is impaired due to genetics or chronic liver disease. A death was reported in a man with liver cirrhosis who overdosed on caffeinated mints. Treatment of mild caffeine intoxication is directed toward symptom relief. Severe intoxication may require peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, or hemofiltration. According to DSST, alcohol provides a reduction in performance and caffeine has a significant improvement in performance. When alcohol and caffeine are consumed jointly, the effects produced by caffeine are affected, but the alcohol effects remain the same. For example, when additional caffeine is added, the drug effect produced by alcohol is not reduced. However, the jitteriness and alertness given by caffeine is decreased when additional alcohol is consumed. Alcohol consumption alone reduces both inhibitory and activational aspects of behavioral control. Caffeine antagonizes the activational aspect of behavioral control, but has no effect on the inhibitory behavioral control. Dipropyl cyclopentylxanthine, 8 cyclopentyl 1,3 dimethylxanthine, 8 phenylthiophylline. Smoking tobacco increases caffeine clearance by 56%. Birth control pills can extend the half-life of caffeine, requiring greater attention to caffeine consumption. Caffeine sometimes increases the effectiveness of some medications, such as those for headaches. Addiction In the absence of caffeine and when a person is awake and alert, little adenosine is present in neurons. With a continued wakeful state, over time it accumulates in the neuronal synapse, in turn binding to and activating adenosine receptors found on certain CNS neurons. When activated, these receptors produce a cellular response that ultimately increases drowsiness. When caffeine is consumed, it antagonizes adenosine receptors, in other words, Caffeine prevents adenosine from activating the receptor by blocking the location on the receptor where adenosine binds to it. As a result, caffeine temporarily prevents or relieves drowsiness, and thus maintains or restores alertness. Caffeine is an antagonist at all four adenosine receptor subtypes, although with varying potencies. 
The affinity values of caffeine for the human adenosine receptors are 12 μm at A1, 2.4 μm at A2A, 13 μm at A2B, and 80 μm at A3. Knockout mouse studies have specifically implicated antagonism of the A2A receptor as responsible for the wakefulness-promoting effects of caffeine. Antagonism of adenosine receptors by caffeine stimulates the medullary vagal, vasomotor, and respiratory centers, which increases respiratory rate, reduces heart rate, and constricts blood vessels. Adenosine receptor antagonism also promotes neurotransmitter release, which endows caffeine with its stimulant effects. Adenosine acts as an inhibitory neurotransmitter that suppresses activity in the central nervous system. Heart palpitations are caused by blockade of the A1 receptor. Because caffeine is both water and lipid soluble, it readily crosses the blood-brain barrier that separates the bloodstream from the interior of the brain. Once in the brain, the principal mode of action is as a non-selective antagonist of adenosine receptors. The caffeine molecule is structurally similar to adenosine, and is capable of binding to adenosine receptors on the surface of cells without activating them, thereby acting as a competitive antagonist. Dependence and Withdrawal Risk of Other Diseases Overdose In addition to its activity at adenosine receptors, caffeine is an inositol trisphosphate receptor 1 antagonist and a voltage-independent activator of the rheonotine receptors. It is also a competitive antagonist of the ionotropic glycine receptor. While caffeine does not directly bind to any dopamine receptors, it influences the binding activity of dopamine at its receptors in the striatum by binding to adenosine receptors that have formed GPCR heteromers with dopamine receptors, specifically the A1D1 receptor heterodimer and the A2AD2 receptor heterotetramer. The A2AD2 receptor heterotetramer has been identified as a primary pharmacological target of caffeine, primarily because it mediates some of its psychostimulant effects and its pharmacodynamic interactions with dopaminergic psychostimulants. Caffeine also causes the release of dopamine in the dorsal striatum and nucleus accumbens core, but not the nucleus accumbens shell by antagonizing A1 receptors in the axon terminal of dopamine neurons and A1A2A heterodimers in the axon terminal of glutamate neurons. During chronic caffeine use, caffeine-induced dopamine release within the nucleus accumbens core is markedly reduced due to drug tolerance. Caffeine, like other xanthines, also acts as a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. As a competitive non-selective phosphodiesterase inhibitor, caffeine raises intracellular CAMP, activates protein kinase A, inhibits TNF-alpha and leukotriene synthesis, and reduces inflammation and innate immunity. Caffeine also affects the cholinergic system where it inhibits the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. Caffeine antagonizes adenosine A2A receptors in the ventrolateral preoptic area, thereby reducing inhibitory GABA neurotransmission to the tubra mammillary nucleus, a histaminergic projection nucleus that activation dependently promotes arousal. Disinhibition of the tubra mammillary nucleus is the chief mechanism by which caffeine produces wakefulness promoting effects. Interactions Caffeine from coffee or other beverages is absorbed by the small intestine within 45 minutes of ingestion and distributed throughout all bodily tissues. Peak blood concentration is reached within 1-2 hours. It is eliminated by first-order kinetics. Caffeine can also be absorbed rectally evidenced by suppositories of ergotamine tartrate and caffeine and chlorobutanol and caffeine. However, 
rectal absorption is less efficient than oral, the maximum concentration and total amount absorbed are both about 30% of the oral amounts. Caffeine's biological half-life The time required for the body to eliminate one half of a dose varies widely among individuals according to factors such as pregnancy, other drugs, liver enzyme function level and age. In healthy adults, caffeine's half-life is between 3-7 hours. Smoking decreases the half-life by 30-50% while oral contraceptives can double it and pregnancy can raise it to as much as 15 hours during the last trimester. In newborns the half-life can be 80 hours or more, dropping very rapidly with age, possibly to less than the adult value by age 6 months. The antidepressant fluvoxamine reduces the clearance of caffeine by more than 90%, and increases its elimination half-life more than tenfold, from 4.9 hours to 56 hours. Caffeine is metabolized in the liver by the cytochrome P450 oxidase enzyme system, in particular, by the CYP1A2 isozyme, into 3-dimethylxanthines, each of which has its own effects on the body. 1,3,7 trimethyluric acid is a minor caffeine metabolite. Each of these metabolites is further metabolized and then excreted in the urine. Caffeine can accumulate in individuals with severe liver disease, increasing its half-life. A 2011 review found that increased caffeine intake was associated with a variation in two genes that increase the rate of caffeine catabolism. Subjects who had this mutation on both chromosomes consumed 40 mg more caffeine per day than others. This is presumably due to the need for a higher intake to achieve a comparable desired effect not that the gene led to a disposition for greater incentive of habituation. Pure anhydrous caffeine is a bitter-tasting white odorless powder with a melting point of 235-238 degrees C. Caffeine is moderately soluble in water at room temperature, but very soluble in boiling water. It is also moderately soluble in ethanol. It is weakly basic requiring strong acid to protonate it. Caffeine does not contain any stereogenic centers and hence is classified as an achiral molecule. The xanthine core of caffeine contains two fused rings, a pyrimidine dione and a midazole. The pyrimidine dione in turn contains two amide functional groups that exist predominantly in its vitrionic resonance the location from which the nitrogen atoms are double bonded to their adjacent amide carbons atoms. Hence all six of the atoms within the pyrimidine dione ring system are sp2 hybridized and planar. Therefore, the fused 5,6 ring core of caffeine contains a total of 10 pi electrons and hence according to Huckel's rule is aromatic. The biosynthesis of caffeine is an example of convergent evolution among different species. Caffeine may be synthesized in the lab starting with dimethyluria and malonic acid. Commercial supplies of caffeine are not usually manufactured synthetically because the chemical is readily available as a byproduct of decaffeination. Alcohol Tobacco Extraction of caffeine from coffee, to produce caffeine and decaffeinated coffee, can be performed using a number of solvents. Benzene, chloroform, trichloroethylene, and dichloromethane have all been used over the years but for reasons of safety, environmental impact, cost, and flavor, they have been superseded by the following main methods. Decaffeinated coffees do in fact contain caffeine in many cases some commercially available decaffeinated coffee products contain considerable levels. One study found that decaffeinated coffee contained 10 mg of caffeine per cup, 
compared to approximately 85 mg of caffeine per cup for regular coffee. Birth Control Caffeine can be quantified in blood, plasma, or serum to monitor therapy in neonates, confirm a diagnosis of poisoning, or facilitate a medical legal death investigation. Plasma caffeine levels are usually in the range of 210 mg l in coffee drinkers, 1236 mg l in neonates receiving treatment for apnea, and 4400 mg l in victims of acute overdosage. Urinary caffeine concentration is frequently measured in competitive sports programs for which a level in excess of 15 mg l is usually considered to represent abuse. Medications Pharmacology Pharmacodynamics Receptor and ion channel targets Effects on striatal dopamine Enzyme targets Off-target effects Pharmacokinetics Chemistry Synthesis Decaffeination Detection in body fluids Analogs Precipitation of tannins Some analog substances have been created which mimic caffeine's properties with either function or structure or both. Of the latter group are the xanthines DMPX and 8-chlorothiophylline, which is an ingredient in Dramamine. Members of a class of nitrogen-substituted xanthines are often proposed as potential alternatives to caffeine. Many other xanthine analogs constituting the adenosine receptor antagonist class have also been elucidated. Some other caffeine analogs Caffeine, as do other alkaloids such as synchonine, quinine, or strychnine, precipitates polyphenols and tannins. This property can be used in a quantitation method. Around 60 plant species are known to contain caffeine. Common sources are the beans of the two cultivated coffee plants, Coffea arabica and Coffea conifera, in the leaves of the tea plant and in cola nuts. Other sources include Yupon holly leaves, South American holly yerba mate leaves, seeds from Amazonian maple garana berries, and Amazonian holly guayusa leaves. Temperate climates around the world have produced unrelated caffeine-containing plants. Caffeine in plants acts as a natural pesticide, it can paralyze and kill predator insects feeding on the plant. High caffeine levels are found in coffee seedlings when they are developing foliage and lack mechanical protection. In addition, high caffeine levels are found in the surrounding soil of coffee seedlings, which inhibits seed germination of nearby coffee seedlings, thus giving seedlings with the highest caffeine levels fewer competitors for existing resources for survival. Caffeine is stored in tea leaves in two places. Firstly, in the cell vacuoles where it is complexed with polyphenols. This caffeine probably is released into the mouth parts of insects, to discourage herbivory. Secondly, around the vascular bundles where it probably inhibits pathogenic fungi from entering and colonizing the vascular bundles. Caffeine in nectar may improve the reproductive success of the pollen-producing plants by enhancing the reward memory of pollinators such as honeybees. The differing perceptions in the effects of ingesting beverages made from various plants containing caffeine could be explained by the fact that these beverages also contain varying mixtures of other methylxanthine alkaloids, including the cardiac stimulants theophylline and theobromine, and polyphenols that can form insoluble complexes with caffeine. Products containing caffeine are coffee, tea, soft drinks, energy drinks, other beverages, chocolate, caffeine tablets, 
other oral products, and inhalation. The world's primary source of caffeine is the coffee bean, from which coffee is brewed. Caffeine content in coffee varies widely depending on the type of coffee bean and the method of preparation used, even beans within a given bush can show variations in concentration. In general, one serving of coffee ranges from 80 to 100 mg, for a single shot of Arabica variety espresso, to approximately 125 mg for a cup of drip coffee. Arabica coffee typically contains half the caffeine of the Robusta variety. In general, dark roast coffee has very slightly less caffeine than lighter roasts because the roasting process reduces caffeine content of the bean by a small amount. Tea contains more caffeine than coffee by dry weight. A typical serving, however, contains much less since tea is normally brewed more weakly than coffee. Also contributing to caffeine content are growing conditions, processing techniques, and other variables. Thus, teas contain varying amounts of caffeine. Tea contains small amounts of theobromine and slightly higher levels of theophylline than coffee. Preparation and many other factors have a significant impact on tea and color is a very poor indicator of caffeine content. Teas like the pale Japanese green tea, Gyakuro, for example, contain far more caffeine than much darker teas like Lapsang Sushang, which has very little. Caffeine is also a common ingredient of soft drinks, such as cola, originally prepared from cola nuts. Soft drinks typically contain 0 to 55 mg of caffeine per 12-ounce serving. By contrast, energy drinks, such as Red Bull, can start at 80 mg of caffeine per serving. The caffeine in these drinks either originates from the ingredients used or is an additive derived from the product of decaffeination or from chemical synthesis. Garina a prime ingredient of energy drinks, contains large amounts of caffeine with small amounts of theobromine and theophylline in a naturally occurring slow-release excipient. Chocolate derived from cocoa beans contains a small amount of caffeine. The weak stimulant effect of chocolate may be due to a combination of theobromine and theophylline, as well as caffeine. A typical 28-gram serving of a milk chocolate bar has about as much caffeine as a cup of decaffeinated coffee. By weight, dark chocolate has 1 to 2 times the amount of caffeine as coffee, 8160 mg per 100 grams. Higher percentages of cocoa such as 90% amount to 200 mg per 100 grams approximately and thus, a 100 gram 85% cocoa chocolate bar contains about 195 mg caffeine. Tablets offer the advantages over coffee and tea of convenience, known dosage, and avoiding concomitant sugar, acid and fluid intake. Manufacturers of caffeine tablets claim that using caffeine of pharmaceutical quality improves mental alertness. These tablets are commonly used by students studying for their exams and by people who work or drive for long hours. One U.S. company is marketing oral dissolvable caffeine strips. Another intake route is Spestic, a caffeinated lip balm. Alert Energy Caffeine Gum was introduced in the United States in 2013 but was voluntarily withdrawn after an announcement of an investigation by the FDA of the health effects of added caffeine in foods. There are several products being marketed that offer inhalers that deliver proprietary blends of supplements, with caffeine being a key ingredient. In 2012, the FDA sent a warning letter to one of the companies marketing these inhalers, 
expressing concerns for the lack of safety information available about inhaled caffeine. According to Chinese legend, the Chinese Emperor Shenong, reputed to have reigned in about 3000 BCE, accidentally discovered tea when he noted that when certain leaves fell into boiling water, a fragrant and restorative drink resulted. Shenong is also mentioned in Luyu's Cha Jing, a famous early work on the subject of tea. The earliest credible evidence of either coffee drinking or knowledge of the coffee tree appears in the middle of the 15th century, in the Sufi monasteries of the Yemen in southern Arabia. From Mocha, coffee spread to Egypt and North Africa, and by the 16th century, it had reached the rest of the Middle East, Persia, and Turkey. From the Middle East, coffee drinking spread to Italy, then to the rest of Europe, and coffee plants were transported by the Dutch to the East Indies and to the Americas. Cola nut use appears to have ancient origins. It is chewed in many West African cultures, individually or in a social setting, to restore vitality and ease hunger pangs. The earliest evidence of cocoa bean use comes from residue found in an ancient Mayan pot dated to 600 BCE. Also, chocolate was consumed in a bitter and spicy drink called cocolatl, often seasoned with vanilla, chili pepper, and acayote. Cocolatl was believed to fight fatigue, a belief probably attributable to the theobromine and caffeine content. Chocolate was an important luxury good throughout pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, and cocoa beans were often used as currency. Cocolat was introduced to Europe by the Spaniards, and became a popular beverage by 1700. The Spaniards also introduced the cacao tree into the West Indies and the Philippines. It was used in alchemical processes, where it was known as black bean. The leaves and stems of the Yupon holly were used by Native Americans to brew a tea called ACI or the black drink. Archaeologists have found evidence of this use far into antiquity, possibly dating to late archaic times. In 1819, the German chemist Fried Lieb Ferdinand Runge isolated relatively pure caffeine for the first time, he called it calf base. According to Runge, he did this at the behest of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. In 1821, caffeine was isolated both by the French chemist Pierre-Jean Robiquit and by another pair of French chemists, Pierre-Joseph Pelletier and Joseph Bienem Caventu, according to Swedish chemist Johns Jacob Berzelius in his yearly journal. Furthermore, Berzelius stated that the French chemists had made their discoveries independently of any knowledge of Runge's or each other's work. However, Berzelius later acknowledged Runge's priority in the extraction of caffeine, stating, however, at this point, it should not remain unmentioned that Runge specified the same method and described caffeine under the name Caffe Base a year earlier than Robiquit to whom the discovery of this substance is usually attributed, having made the first oral announcement about it at a meeting of the Pharmacy Society in Paris. Pelletier's article on caffeine was the first to use the term in print. It corroborates Berzelius's account. Caffeine, noun. Crystallizable substance discovered in coffee in 1821 by Mr. Robiquit. During the same period while they were searching for quinine in coffee because coffee is considered by several doctors to be a medicine that reduces fevers and because coffee belongs to the same family as the cinchona tree on their part, Messrs. Pelletier and Cavan to obtained caffeine but because their research had a different goal and because their research had not been finished, they left priority on this subject to Mr. Robiquit. 
We do not know why Mr. Robiquit has not published the analysis of coffee which he read to the Pharmacy Society. Its publication would have allowed us to make caffeine better known and give us accurate ideas of coffee's composition. Robiquit was one of the first to isolate and describe the properties of pure caffeine, whereas Pelletier was the first to perform an elemental analysis. In 1827, Amudrai isolated theine from tea, but it was later proved by Mulder and by Carl Jobst that theine was actually caffeine. In 1895, German chemist Hermann Emil Fischer first synthesized caffeine from its chemical components, and two years later, he also derived the structural formula of the compound. This was part of the work for which Fisher was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1902. Because it was recognized that coffee contained some compound that acted as a stimulant, first coffee and later also caffeine has sometimes been subject to regulation. For example, in the 16th century Islamists in Mecca and in the Ottoman Empire made coffee illegal for some classes. Charles II of England tried to ban it in 1676, Frederick II of Prussia banned it in 1777, and coffee was banned in Sweden at various times between 1756 and 1823. In 1911, caffeine became the focus of one of the earliest documented health scares when the U.S. government seized 40 barrels and 20 kegs of Coca-Cola syrup in Chattanooga, Tennessee, alleging the caffeine in its drink was injurious to health. Although the judge ruled in favor of Coca-Cola, two bills were introduced to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1912 to amend the Pure Food and Drug Act, adding caffeine to the list of habit-forming and deleterious substances which must be listed on a product's label. The Food and Drug Administration in the United States currently allows only beverages containing less than 0.02% caffeine, but caffeine powder, which is sold as a dietary supplement, is unregulated. It is a regulatory requirement that the label of most pre-packaged foods must declare a list of ingredients, including food additives such as caffeine, in descending order of proportion. However, there is no regulatory provision for mandatory quantitative labeling of caffeine. There are a number of food ingredients that naturally contain caffeine. These ingredients must appear in food ingredient lists. However, as is the case for food additive caffeine, there is no requirement to identify the quantitative amount of caffeine in composite foods containing ingredients that are natural sources of caffeine. While coffee or chocolate are broadly recognized as caffeine sources, some ingredients are likely less recognized as caffeine sources. For these natural sources of caffeine, there is no regulatory provision requiring that a food label identify the presence of caffeine nor state the amount of caffeine present in the food. Global consumption of caffeine has been estimated at 120,000 tons per year, making it the world's most popular psychoactive substance. This amounts to one serving of a caffeinated beverage for every person every day. Some Seventh-day Adventists, Church of God adherents, and Christian scientists do not consume caffeine. Some from these religions believe that one is not supposed to consume a non-medical, psychoactive substance, or believe that one is not supposed to consume a substance that is addictive. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has said the following with regard to caffeinated beverages. The Church Revelation spelling out health practices does not mention the use of caffeine. The Church's health guidelines prohibit alcoholic drinks, smoking, or chewing of tobacco, 
and hot drinks taught by church leaders to refer specifically to tea and coffee. Gaudi ya Vaishnavas generally also abstain from caffeine, because they believe it clouds the mind and overstimulates the senses. To be initiated under a guru, one must have had no caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, or other drugs, for at least a year. Caffeinated beverages are widely consumed by Muslims today. In the 16th century, some Muslim authorities made unsuccessful attempts to ban them as forbidden intoxicating beverages under Islamic dietary laws. Recently discovered bacteria Pseudomonas putida CBB5 can live on pure caffeine and can cleave caffeine into carbon dioxide and ammonia. Caffeine is toxic to birds and to dogs and cats, and has a pronounced adverse effect on mollusks, various insects, and spiders. This is at least partly due to a poor ability to metabolize the compound, causing higher levels for a given dose per unit weight. Caffeine has also been found to enhance the reward memory of honeybees. Caffeine has been used to double chromosomes in haploid wheat. Natural Occurrence Products Beverages Coffee Tea Soft drinks and energy drinks Other beverages Chocolate Tablets Other oral products Inhalants Combinations with other drugs History Discovery and spread of use Chemical identification, isolation, and synthesis Historic regulations Society and culture Regulations Consumption Religions other organisms Research Bibliography